When most legends are inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, they're typically introduced with mentions of their era-defining accomplishments and statistical brilliance. On Tuesday, Lanny McDonald, the chair of the board of the hall, took the unusual step of introducing a new inductee by citing a different set of numbers, cold, hard financials. By McDonald's count, Gary Bettman's quarter-century tenure as NHL commissioner has coincided with a growth in annual league revenues of some $3.5 billion U.S., that's billion, with a B, as in boo. And Bettman's induction means booze. Are what we'd be hearing at November's induction ceremony, that is, if they allowed actual fans to populate the formal wear affair that is, with few exceptions, the exclusive domain of hockey's back-slapping boys club. Gary Bettman will be heading into the Hockey Hall of Fame later this year as a builder, but the timing of the induction is bizarre considering he's still at the helm of the NHL, writes Dave Fezchok, Daryl Dyke, the Canadian press, as it is the unwashed who've long resented Bettman for his many crimes against the game, three lockouts and a 2018 Olympics without NH Lerd, for starters, can only shake their heads at the bizarre timing of Bettman's enshrinement in hockey's not-so-sacred shrine. Read more, in his 25 years as NHL commissioner, Gary Bettman has been the boss, the villain and many things in between article continued below Gary Bettman stands by decision to miss 2018 Winter Olympic Jockey Hall of Fame finally puts Willie. Where he belongs the folks who protect the images of the world's more logically run sports usually suggest it best to wait for the supreme leader to step away from power before being bestowed with such honors. Commissioners who've been Bettman's contemporaries, say, baseball's Bud Selig and basketball's David Stern, reveled in their Hall of Fame moments post-retirement. To rule a sport while simultaneously being crowned one of its immortals, it does seem a titch North Korean. But to quote a great quasher of alleged conspiracy theories, there is no collusion, folks. It was only Bettman's predecessor, Gil Stein, who left the game in disgrace after he was caught engineering his own election into the Art Hockey Hall of Fame. You'd figure Bettman, who's never been accused of being dumb and who launched the investigation into Stein's enshrinement as one of his first orders of business in the job, might have learned a few things in those probings. But hey, $3.5 billion. And look over there, Willieary, that was the saddest part of Tuesday's induction announcement. There were worthy inductees, including Ari, only the man who broke hockey's color barrier, who had their moment usurped by this misstep by the commissioner's bootlickers. Martin Brodert, the great goaltender, was a no-doubter, the all-time leader in shutouts and wins, and also, thanks to his 20-year career, goals against and losses. But unlike Bettman, Broder had to wait until he was three years out of the league to get his moment, as is the player-specific protocol. It was great to see Jaina Hefford get the nod. She was a stalwart of the women's national team for five Olympics. And along with longtime cohorts Haley Wickenheiser and Carolyn Willett, Hefford holds a record no Canadian has yet to match for Olympic golds. Article continued below Martin St. Louis is a classic underdog, one of just six undrafted players to score 1,000 NHL points. Even if he's nobody's idea of an all-timer, one heart trophy and one scoring title wouldn't be enough if the Hall had more credible standards, he more than clears the low bar that's been set by a selection committee that has happily invited role players like into the fold. McDonald's anecdote about reaching inductee Alexander Yakeshev, who took the call having just finished playing in a hockey game at age 71, spoke to the ceaseless competitive spirit that lives inside special athletes. Yakeshev, of course, led the Soviet Union in scoring during the Epical Summit Series in 1972, said McDonald. When I asked him, did you win the game, he said, yes, we won the game. This is the best day ever. It was a great day, too, for the more than worthy Ari, who, like Bettman, was inducted as a builder.
he wasn't a great player, he played 45 games in the league. And he wasn't necessarily a trendsetter, after a rebroke hockey's color barrier in 1958 the next player of color didn't come along for some 16 years. But Ari, 82, did grow to become a giant in the sport, especially in the eyes of those who have followed his path as outliers in a predominantly white game, especially after he was hired by the league in the role of ambassador in the mid-1990s. I was laughing and I was crying, and I was at a loss for words. Ari told a media conference call. I'm just so happy that I'm alive to be able to share this induction into the Hall of Fame, not only with my family, but with a lot of my friends, at least, he was alive, indeed. Four of the previous eight inductees in the builder category, including ex-Leaf coaches Pat Quinn and Pat Burns, couldn't say the same on their induction day. So that was one of the arguments for Bettman's induction, give it to him while he's lucid and breathing. Fair enough. There were other reasons, for sure. Previous commissioners, presidents, as they were known, have been enshrined while in office. Ditto general managers like Lou Lamoriello and Glenn Sather. Also, last year the esteemed selection committee tapped the shoulder of Jeremy Jacobs, the Boston Bruins owner who claimed in a 2015 court deposition to have never heard of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the degenerative brain disease that's been repeatedly found in hockey players with histories of repeated head trauma. Concussion denial, one of Bettman's tombstone accomplishments, needs a persistent platform if it's going to stay relevant. None of this is to say Bettman won't be one day fit for induction, it's an assumed benefit of the gig. But now, McDonald spoke of unprecedented economic growth during Bettman's tenure. That there's been unprecedented growth in virtually every area of sports during Bettman's tenure, lots of it thanks to a massive inflation and TV rights fees. A more relevant measurement goes like this. Bettman took over the NHL at an opportune moment in 1993. It was around that time that a Sports Illustrated cover story attempted to explain why the NHL's hot and the NBA's not Wayne Gretzky was en route to winning the last of his NHL scoring titles. Hockey seemed sexy. Meanwhile the NBA, from whence the NHL plucked Bettman, was struggling with Michael Jordan in baseball and an on-court product sullied by defense first physicality. Then came hockey's 1994-95 lockout, the first of three work stoppages under Bettman's reign. Then came the first time the Stanley Cup wasn't presented since the First World War a decade later. While the NBA look global, the NHL remains local. Now basketball's pop culture primacy dwarfs hockey's tiny niche. The NHL remains hugely dependent on the profits from its lucrative Canadian markets. It doesn't even need to be said that Bettman's service to those franchises is as questionable as his service to the ever-booing fans. Then again, why would the Hockey Hall of Fame Selection Committee consider the perspective of the only country in the world where the game isn't a minnow? As the Supreme Leader established long ago, that's not the NHL way. Dave Fezchik is a Toronto-based sports columnist. Follow him on Twitter, at DeFezchuk.